the spotted fronds and the sands of time. Imagine free to live in such a place where the milk of strange intentions sets upon your sated savage browed feet like a bird of prey whose beak is shaped as that of a canoe. Or maybe, oh, to fall and gather a new plumb line, hook, line, and sinker, Mark Twain, before it was even anyone's wow. alias. We have good sound. All right. So I'm going to remove the placard. All right. Hold on now. All right. Uh, look at that. There you are, live. All right. The content of it has now become hallelujah, it would seem. If you have audio now, if you can hear th this speech of words, um, indicate to Eric by sending him a signal upon the video streamer or whatever, if I'm using the terminology right, and who knows? I mean, I'm here to misplace all kinds of terminologies. But if, if we're coming through, if we are coming through, Eric will give me a thumbs up, but <laughs> what's really beginning to happen is for me. The challenge now takes a certain turn. Okay, you're good. All right. You're All right. Oh, right people. All right. Everything is everything is as it should be. And even if it were not, we would still be here doing what we do. Because after all, we got to do uh, something. <laughs> anyway, so now, yes, I have to I have to speak. Oh, you should have heard what I was saying when the audio was off. Ah. But now I've got to tie it together into a common theme, a common theme and a common thread. Oh, it's always such a challenge. Oh, it's always such a chasm. Oh, it's always such a chasm in the mountain. Oh, it's such a cave. For I guess it is with the image of the cave that we could now commence. The image of the cave and our pathway toward it and what we seek for and what we find inside of it and its meaning in our minds and in our conception of ourselves, um, there is the cave. And it has its, it connotes almost immediately a place of shelter and of closeness to the earth and going to ground, so to speak. It denotes also a sense of the complexity, the complexity of the coziness of the Cro-Magnon, yes, of the cave dweller, the primeval cave dweller whom Anthropos acknowledges in all the glory of that science so artfully conveyed that the Cro-Magnon, the interior dimensions of the Cro-Magnon's physical capacities were every bit like unto ours in terms of the ability of speech, consciousness, depiction, oh, something then, oh, so familiar, if not identical, and correct me here if I'm wrong, my scientific terminology would be, hmm, poetically exact, or you could say in the people's key, <laughs> in the people's key of approximate. But nevertheless, we know the similarities of the Cro-Magnon, but go before that to the Neanderthal, because yes, Sometimes they were contemporary, the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthal. And still, they expressed the awareness of a non-corporeal aspect of existence. And it is that most primordial gesture, out of that most primordial gesture of, okay, let me specify it just a little bit more, um, of a belief, well, a belief or a, a vision or a trust or a hope or a faith. All of this is possible when you see what their hands did. The first art is the scrapings, the concave scrapings on the underside of the rock of a burial tomb. Concave scrapings made by the hand of the Neanderthals. This is the first art. This is the first abstract tract. This is the first expression of consciousness. This is the first. Well, I, you know, I can say the first, but there were, were ones before that. No, let's just say that um, out of the writings of 
R.G. Levy. I am struck by, uh, again and again, how she takes uh, as points of um, exploration these um, primordial religious conceptions um, and puts them together with each other from the standpoint of her extensive archaeological background and puts them together, though, with the, the awareness in her consciousness of the essential nature. I mean, what I'm saying is um, it's the rigor of the Aristotelian approach to experimental data, of course, but that is one layer, and that is only one layer that is a static a static layer, you could say, uh, you know, but at the same time, the insight derived from that form of inquiry contributes every bit as much as anything more or less wild, right? So, lest I go off on too much of a tangent about that. Um, still, it is in the interpretations of these things. Let's give you, uh, let me give you an example. Okay, what I want to say is, in general terms, just to start off, I want to say two things, two general things. The notion of classic, especially classic, a classic work of literature, classic, and then the, uh, the other thing is, oh yes, has to do with the vision of life that is contained within the work. Um, as we uh, grow in our own spiraling labyrinth, sometimes maze, other times pathway in the study of literature, we are moved in ourselves in unique ways. And I tell you this, every reader who reads with a sense of what it is in there that really moves them is on the path of using their own human discernment of seeking out as lodestones or guiding stars or lodestars the classics, their own classics. One would seek out the things that speak to them so that one would, would just become part of what you navigate by in the sky. Or it might lead to a different way of understanding the reflections in the puddles by the side of the road, left by the rain. All of these things can be expressed within the inner energy of the word, but it takes two. It takes the inspired creator of the literature, and it takes the inspired reader of the literature. What makes inspiration in a writer? You could talk about it forever if you wanted to. It's a mystery. Let's just put it there for a while. But what else is a mystery in the consciousness of the inspired reader? What's a mystery there? And just as spontaneous is the intuitive keening, the intuitive kenning, the knowledge. It's like a more archaic form of the word knowledge a more archaic form of understanding where something leaps the barrier, so to speak, leaps the barrier and, and moves you in this unexpected way, and you'll never know why. It is almost as if it opens up a world, a world where you can be in the consciousness of the way that it has moved you. This is one way of describing it, and it goes on and on, doesn't it now? The uniqueness, because you yourself have your own way of describing it to yourself. And so this, this, so in that light, everything that I'm saying here could be a misdirection, a misdirection, but that's part of it too, because I'm talking about labyrinths, I'm talking about paths, I'm talking about mazes, I'm talking about footsteps, I'm talking about particles, particle, particles along the wavelength, the wavelengths of wholeness and the particles of our steps toward that, the limitations of our human intelligence in the midst of the encompassing intelligence of the natural universe around us. And so in between, there are many steps, directions and misdirections. You would, I would paraphrase her Heraclitus with his idea, his kenning, his uh, intuitive insight that expressed as a paradox, that the way up is the way down. The way up is the way down. Remember that. Next time, you are on a spiral staircase. You may meet a traveler on that spiral staircase, and they may be carrying 
a lantern. And yet they may be hooded, and yet they may be cloaked, and yet they may be concealed. The lantern itself is only partially seen, but the light that it casts upon the stairs as the traveler moves leaves one thing that you just don't know. Is the traveler on the spiral staircase going up? Or is the traveler on the spiral staircase going down? It's impossible to say. Anyway, so it's a vision of life conveyed in seemingly uh, unexpected ways that uh, Rachel Gertrude Levy communicates to us down through the ages. All right, so let's let her speak to us through the energy of the word coming off of the page. Remembering also, this is how, this is an example of a classic being uh, brought to a point where I can begin to like tell you of the world, you know, that it makes possible in me, out of which comes these ideas and these words. So, you know, what other time machine can there be but that? I would hardly call it that. But here's what she says. Uh, the following pages, however, were not undertaken to prove a theory, which were not undertaken to prove a theory, but developed under the stimulus of a continual surprise. They deal with the survival of a body of related ceremonial customs, which seem, however greatly their significance, may have deepened and widened in the early civilizations upon which our own is founded to have their sources at the very beginnings of discernible human institutions. There they appear, not as haphazard or isolated phenomena, but already organized into a coherent discipline which may even merit the name of a religion. Okay. A chunk of prose, right? And it, and it comes at you, and it suddenly, you know, I approach it, and it's like, um, I am on the banks of a river, and the river is my own kind of flowing stream of attention, and at the same time, I'm looking up as I guide my craft and I see, you know, the cliffside and the striations and the layers and all the indications of that. And yet, you know, a rock tumbles down and the entire hillside is changed. Or yet maybe a pelican or a mockingbird or a cowbird comes to land upon some outcropping and the entire p figure is, picture is changed. You know how the news gets put down. A page, a paragraph of prose can suddenly, sometimes in, the, in an instant of consciousness, present itself to you in the same way. And then what do you do? Oh, well, you have to have the language to say it. The language that you have to say it has to appear in your mind. And it is given to you by your mother, the language of the paragraph upon the page that you read. So, undertaken not to prove a theory, but developed under the stimulus of a continual surprise. See, that's what that's a statement of. Developed under the stimulus of a continual surprise. This is how this archaeological book describing the discoveries found in archaeological diggings in prehistoric ruins in places like Iraq and Palestine in the 1930s. This is where R.G. Levy was as uh, an archaeologist with the University of London, um, beginning, I am sure, and seeing with her own eyes the things that were being excavated, which, for her, you understand, they are not so much excavations as revelations. And she's beginning to see these things, and one can only imagine how it begins, its nascence in her mind. Because then, oh, there's another excursion, there's another trip to Brittany. Uh, you know, those dolmens, those stone uh, structures, prehistoric Brittany, and also down there in southwest France, near a part of the Pyrenees, 
I have never been, but down under the ground where I have only hardly been, in those caves down there. I haven't been in those, of course. I've been in caves of my own. <laughs> no, actually, the caves of the, of the cave paintings. She saw some of those things reflected on them more than the life energies of animals she saw depicted on the cave, the cave walls, more than the life energies of the animals, more than a sense of the creative joy of a human hand out of the materials of the earth and its own technique creates an image of that which gives it life and by whom life, by whose life it lives, right? The buffalo, the hunted animals, the gazelles, the stags, you know, the creatures, and also the people, and the hand drawings, and all of these cave paintings deep within the earth, in inaccessible places. Never have I heard more, you know, I don't know, uh, succinctly evoked the mystery of the awe and the wonder of the inaccessibility of those paintings, those artworks in those caves. I mean, how both utilitarian can you get keeping them down there under the earth where they can lay unknown for eons and then be rediscovered by those who have no other idea of what their inner consciousness was like than what suddenly opens up to them as they tread upon the ground and go into these chasms in the mountain, into these caves. And there they discover these mysteries done in the deep, dark womb of Mother Earth. And these things are wondrous. And her response to these wondrous signs is this work of art here, this book called The Gate of Horn. It links these primordial conscious expressions into uh, a further odyssey of a further unfoldment of their, meaning, of their meaning in ways that relates to our own conception of the paths of our individual and communal lives in such a way that it becomes it, it's a, a source of richness for us to contemplate as we go along, if we wish to. Um, may offer a certain proof. Okay, I want to say one more thing, the second paragraph. Let's see if we can track it, if I can track it, you know, in my mind as I'm reading and thinking at the same time, which is my own kind of cave, okay? No line of research into the distribution through time and space of individual rights or objects of cult which may seem to bear a, a relation to the earliest known ceremonies, can offer certain proof of development from a common source. But the weight of the whole body of evidence accumulated here is offered as the expression of a living, of a living unity of belief and practice, which underlies the religious, artistic, and social development of the ancient world before the revolutions of the Iron Age. So no certain proof is offered. Remember, she's not expressing a theory necessarily. It's more like a patterned gathering is what we're talking about here. And she, it's, it's still uncertain, but it's offered as an expression of a living unity of belief and practice as the expression. She's offering this material, this interpreted material, interpreted in words of writing upon a page, as an expression of a living unity of belief and practice. So, I mean, I am led to the uh, belief that this very book as a work of art is of the same tradition as the cave paintings, the same tradition of expression, simple conceptual expression of a human consciousness which is made valid by what? Interest. Interest, that's the source of sincerity. Simple interest, not so much a matter of the grandiose wildness, you know, of some earth-shaking proclamation which will transfigure, you know, our bewildered world. 
Nothing like that. No. Tracing a design that is discerned as she goes along in the understanding and the contemplation of the material before her. That's basically what we're talking about. But in the end, there's all that, always that suggestion of a certain kind of like unifying vision of it all. And that too then is, 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 is how this writer conceives a unique vision. This is how the, another way that the book could be considered a classic. This is how this writer, R.G. Levy, gives us a unique vision because at certain points, after the meticulous uh, exposition of certain things, and then a symbol or an image is brought in, and then in some way, not in any obvious way, but the next exposition of the next image embodies this connection, a connection in a, in a fluidity of meaning, so that an intuitive arrangement of an expression of consciousness is made in the mind, so that with a simple result that what you read about the Stone Age you suddenly see part of yourself in that very expression. And that's pretty good. That's pretty edifying, I would say. That's a pretty good way that something could be a classic, you know, in a miraculously kind of didactical sense. The Gate of Horn by R.G. Levy. Levy. Now, I want to say I only said her name out loud, oh, about two and a half hours ago, three hours ago, maybe. Um, before that, it existed in my mind and only in my mind, existing as thinking and writing and kind of held back as pondering, and only did it come to the gates of my mouth when it wanted to. And I found that I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it in a way that sounds that good, <laughs> but that's my own self-consciousness, you know. You probably would have to have an English accent to say it the way it is correct, but we're not after that kind of expression here. So we just, you know, Instead, it's offered in this way, um, as a communion of a certain kind of thought, and, and also as an expression, yes, as an expression of personality, because we do. Um, it is possible, um, as one learns how to appreciate one's self-discovered classics, it is possible to have the fantasy, at least, but a transparent fantasy. In other words, a fantasy that is known as such, but only so far to bring us to the brink of a myth. Because after all, what is personality but a myth? So a feeling of the myth, as she studies these myths, one gets a feeling of the myth of the personality herself, her authorial personality, which is as if someone were in a cave with you and you looked at an inscription on the wall and you both noticed some feature, oh, maybe like that hoof mark of red ochre on the cave wall is painted over an indentation in the earth, which is its canvas, in the exact same place on the hoof of a slightly different antlered creature a little bit further back there in another part of the cave. And you both notice this at the same time, and you simply raise an eyebrow to each other. It's that kind of canniness and that kind of intelligence which appears off of these pages. A personality which offers itself not as a depiction of itself for you to be impressed by or not, but more like an actual living offering of a way of seeing, of a vision of life. So that is a way that some kind of warmth comes about, comes out of this, which enables a, a restless intellect such as my own to be able to trace and track what's really going on here. Hmm. So that's, that's uh, something to be said. So we have a sense then of gratitude to the unknown instructors. Not only R.G. Levy herself, who despite everything, um, there's always going to be something elusive in anything that you come to truly love, in anything that you come to truly love as emanating from a creative spirit. There's always going to be something that, you know, is just left off. I mean, because you cannot, it cannot, you know, hold the impression in your mind forever. And, and that's how that is. So there's a certain kind of element about that. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I wanted to say uh, a feeling of gratitude. Gratitude 
to the unknown instructors. You might remember the poem by Yeats. I believe the title is so beautiful. Gratitude to unknown instructor, instruct, instructors. Gratitude to unknown instructors. What they intended, they brought about. All things hang like a drop of dew upon a blade of grass. What they intended, they brought to pass. All things hang like a drop of dew upon a blade of grass. What they intended, they brought to pass. All things hang like a drop of dew upon a blade of grass. So it starts off with a compressed picture of almost like a human transcendence of time, or maybe a breaking through of the walls of time, or as I like to think of it, more like a molding and remolding of the walls of time, so that time, in a sense, becomes a shelter for the words as they are built in the poem. What they intended, they brought to pass. In other words, they created a vehicle through which the inner energy of the form could pass to us, even over the chasms of thousands of years. So the gratitude to the unknown instructors includes the Stone Age cave painters, deep in the bowels of Mother Earth, creating on the walls the figments and the fragments of something that has a parallel existence in the mundane world of time and space, and yet speaks of something that was hitherto unknown until it was put on the walls of a cavern deep within the earth. These are the unknown instructors that we are, uh, that we feel such gratitude to. And yet, and here's how it is, though. There is the work of art, you know, and the vision of the work of art, and also, well, let me just say for a quick digression, um, the words, you know, and the thoughts appear in the silence of the sound of the mind, you know, in the silence of the sound of the mind, and that's what seems right about them. But then um, they appear in the world of form, in the world of time and space, in this fallen world of form, in this fallen world of time and space, and um, then everything is no longer up to us. It's like the word that is born in the sound of the silence of your mind and crosses the threshold of your lips and uh, takes its form in some kind of work of your own hand, be it only a written line upon a page or a spoken sentence in the air, then, boo, you know, it all goes to its own hotel and its own motel and its own hermitage and its own hovel and it disappears and drifts away in the wind, you know. It reminds me of the parable about the seed. Some seed falls into fertile earth and some seed falls into rocky soil. And some seed is found by the birds of the air and some seeds fructify and die and fall within the earth and bring forth new life, you know. All these things are the form of seeds. That's one metaphorical way to look at them. Sometimes, though, when I read Rachel Levy, I am reminded of the kind of, the, of a thought seed springing out of the consciousness of the ever-living page in the mind when I see so clearly, not with my eyes though, <laughs> when I see so clearly um, some insight into some structure, into some pattern, you know, that, that speaks to the inner quality of, of, of our lives. For example, it is something like this. This is what she found for us. This is what she found for us. And let us also remember that the word troubadour has, well, it's a divining rod of a word in terms of its etymology. The word troubadour it could mean trobar, it could mean to find, it could mean to put together, it could mean to draw from the air, as Uncle Ez put it, but to tro tropier, to invent, to find, to draw from the air. Oh, uh, I don't know. Is conjure from a different family of etymologies? Nevertheless, the ghost bridge is there. The ghost bridge is there to many other forms and ways that we can speak of this word troubadour. I would also note that the original troubadours of the 13th century, the ones by whom are called that name, um, occupied the same ground a little bit to the east and a little bit to the north of where the cave paintings were found. So who knows, right? The subterranean connections. The subterranean connections are there. Um, anyway, 
Um, so the pattern and the structure of our lives. So the cave, all right? But the pathway, the footstep, the created work, the whirl and the grain of wood, um, the spangled branches of the tree, of the tree of life, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of any tree before you in any place. Um, the pattern then down which you walk, the road that you make in your life. This is um, what she brings us. This is what she found. That's the troubadour part. This is what R.G. Levy Troubadour has found for us. And it comes to us via her intuitive consciousness along where Mother Earth first spoke. Her material was in the New Hebrides and those islands out there in the ocean somewhere. In the New Hebrides, there is a... You could say this about anything or any place. And the New Hebrides, there is the goddess. Ah, yes. She, the goddess. I must tell you her name. I don't want to mispronounce it. If you're going to mispronounce the name of any deity, if you mispronounce it, well, you'd best be sincere. And if you're sincere, but who knows? I mean, that's a, a risk all anthropologists take. But um, her name in the New Hebrides, and she can be fierce, La Hev Hev, La Hev Hev, La Hev Hev. Say the name of the goddess three times. That's okay. As Carl Jung wrote upon the walls of his hermitage, an old Gnostic saying, called or not, the god is always present. So it's okay. La Hev Hev. Fierce, taking the form of the, the beast of life there, the tusked boar, the tusked boar, that's one of her forms, and also the hawk. La Hev Hev can be the hawk. La Hev Hev can be the boar. La Hev Hev can also be a twisted bit of nothingness. La Hev Hev can be that bit of fear and doubt and dread found in the grinning net of chaos pulled in by Tiamat in the old Babylonian legends. La Hev Hev can be that. Nevertheless, despite this, oh, and isn't that not, is that not a triple form, by the way? Oh, you know, a silent shout out to that bewildered, bewildering and confusing book and rich and mystifying book, The White Goddess by Robert Graves. You know, the triple goddess. This could be a form of that. And oh, I wonder about the confluence of the intuitive anthropology that goes on sometimes in these things. The thing about those kind of connections is you got to be sure that they don't drive you crazy. <laughs> but, and the only, and, and I, but then again, you know, make sure that there's a space in your mind where you can kind of got, like lose the energy of the thought and find it appearing in another thought. Because it is a play of elemental thoughts that um, the poetic imagination um, casts its, its net toward. Anyway, la hev hev, as the form of a hawk. A hawk that you can see with your eyes? No, a hawk you create. A hawk you create with your imagination, your third eye, your mind, and the work of your hands, and the energies and warmth of your heart. The hawk carved upon the lodge poles of the uh, huts um, and, and, and the lodges of, of, of the people there and the momentary structures made over the sanctuary grounds of the underground uh, spaces where religious ceremonies are performed. These are some of her forms. And then there is another god. I'll have to open up the book and get that god's name, but I will tell you that that god, it's more important to pay attention to the... <laughs> It's not more important to pay attention to the name of that God over any other God. See? See what polytheism polytheism does. It creates, you know, these um, cycles of, of, of quickly moving ideas that blur and glimmer. I guess that's part of the beauty. But one constantly risks, as Lawrence Ferlinghetti said, one constantly risks absurdity, you know, over the trapeze of all the possible meanings that appear and disappear as we go along. Nevertheless, along with La Hev Hev, there is another deity, and this deity is the light of the sun. This deity lives as the light of the sun, though is not the sun itself, and lives in the moon, actually, and yet is not the moon. And uh, this deity has no actual um, earthly location because it's not that kind of God. It's more like, 
you might say, oh, this one is worshipped in spirit and in truth, you might say. But here's the best part about that. Um, first of all, this God's name, Taghar, Taghar, Taghar. You must utter it three times. A male deity, um, even though Lahevhev is um, imaged as a hawk, here's who gets to be the hawk the initiates of the orders of the priestly orders of, 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 of that God, his name I forgot, even though I said it three times. Um, the name of that God, maybe it's a God whose name is good to leave open. Sometimes God's names are that way, but I'll tell you this, this is the God that you don't embody by seeing. This is the God that in the movements of the ceremonies, you sort of like comport yourself to live as a form in space responding to the invisible presence of this god oh this is how dances are are they not originally the inner music and the way it moves through us and the way we externally embody it which may have hardly any kind of like external uh resemblance to the way it's actually moving through our nervous systems. Instead, we offer it in the forms of the visible earth. So, arms outstretched like a hawk, perhaps, or feet rooted to the ground like a tree, maybe, or something like a swaying in the wind, maybe, or something like that. This is the kind of ways that, oh, this is the way she's, she's talking about this. This is her vision coming to us one more time, uh, appearing as this kenning, this pre-rational kind of stab in the dark, not even a stab in the dark that's too aggressive, this more like kind of like welcoming of what light is there out of the dark so that light and darkness will blend into some kind of shape to suggest something that we could respond to in language that is somehow like shadow and light mixed and blended, making a momentary meaning. It could be like that. Um, she offers us uh, an image of the possibility where um, art and religion and the dance and observation, you know, loving holistic observation of some external form and then the inner meaning of it as it relates as a direct uh, comment, a comment or teaching upon the life path of, of an entire peoples. You know, you, the only way to understand something like that is to understand it as a living poetic transmission for in the ways that we are looking at it now, in the ways that we are recollecting it now and putting it together in our minds out of the scattered pieces of a restless imagination. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is the life that we live. What form is the dance that is presided over and in honor of, you know, to the ha ha and, and, and the other God whose, whose name is its name, or his name, I guess. Um, what other form does it take? It takes the structured rituals and dances and enactments and like theatrical godly dramas are enacted in this world of these particular gods in the New Hebrides and um, the dance steps create these labyrinth patterns. The dance steps create the labyrinthian patterns and there are many many kinds and they all have their own kind of meaning and they are all offerings of an image of an image an externalized image of the moving line of thought expressed as lines traced upon the ground ooh put that against our current technological exteriorization of consciousness the computer or the television or any of those any number of those things and the ways the feedback loop that is created and the ways the meaning is um felt and received and given. Compare that to the pathway traced by an individual moving through the complex forms, symbolic depictions of the passages of life and the stages of life under the watchful eyes of the gods and the goddesses, creating intricate patterns. Indeed, these are the steps of the intricate ones and the pattern and the lines that they leave and make for us are practically words that we ourselves can read of the meaning of life. And here's how it works, folks. Here's how something like this is um, taken into this other dimension. Because here's what happens. Here's how it is. You go through your life and you become 
one who has learned and participated in the steps traced upon the ground, and along a cycle in time, you enact them on a regular basis, and their inner elements are revealed to you. They are sometimes in the form of characters. They are sometimes in the form of you as an individual. They are sometimes done, well, I believe that they're always done masked in one way or another, because for the most part, then, it is probably safer to, to describe it as being an objective order of spiritualized, or an, an objectivized order of spiritual nature expressed in the form of the dance and, um, and the costumes and the persona and also the, the styles. There are comedies. There are tragic comedies. There are tragedies. There are odysseys. There are quests. There are prayers. There are fertility cycles. All of these things with their own kind of labyrinthian form, an intricate pattern sketched, traced in the sand. And you learn them, and you learn the elements within them so that your understanding is revi revised as the years go on. And then for the individual comes the time when the individual must die. And then the individual goes into the world we only know of by what we have heard about the gods. We hear the talk about the gods. It goes way, way back. And the only thing that really you start off with is not that they exist or not. That's a distraction. No, it's more like this is what came to us in answer to a, a question that only we could ask. And it is shown to us in a particular way, in the way of the myth. And um, it is for that reason that um, Plato, in all of his philosophical expressions, where he worked to make the dialogue and the persona of Socrates and um, all of the different kind of thoughts and ideas, sometimes emphasizing the primacy of reason to the exclusion of all other things. And yet, in the midst of all this, many, many times, there's all different kinds of myths. Sometimes they're almost direct retellings of the Greek myths, Plato puts in there. Sometimes they're adaptations of certain of the things that the gods do so that he can, oh, I don't know, make a certain point. Oh, and sometimes it's for like the most crudest didactic purposes, which is what? To win friends and influence people. You know, sometimes myth is used in that way. But then there's also a way where the analogy and the metaphor and the image and, and the myth as sometimes it would be related by Socrates when he said, the people here around here say a certain thing. Or maybe Socrates would say, it is said um, that, um, you know, well, he would go off into a tale. And his amenuensis, Plato wrote it down and then it becomes a part of, of our heritage and a part of that philosophy and a paradoxical one. For how can what is often interpreted to be, you know, the paragon of the original reason, the reasoning mind, how can it be anything but something in denial of myth, in denial of fantasy or of imagination? And yet again and again, it's just there. It's part of the whole of the expression. So what could it mean? Well, you know, you could be frustrated by that in different ways. Um, you know, I would just say that um, there are certain forms of expression that certain elements of the imaginative, moral uh, element of the mind only comes into play when it is moved by things like that. So it moves in that way, and then a certain dimension of your own consciousness moves in that way, so that mm, suddenly you see, ah, this is a meaning to interpret. Hmm, I can tell that this interpretation strikes home because something in me moves in response to that. Some, some inner unity is kind of felt or something. And so it's just, it's a part of the expression is what it is. Well, oh, let's continue though. This is the building of a way to understand the pages of the book of the psyche. So if you ma imagine everything that, that I'm saying or trying to say now and think of it as a book, you know, you can turn the pages and you can kind of go back to s stuff and ponder it in a certain way and, and kind of respond in that way. Even the energy of the pages turning will impart a certain kind of momentum, which has different ways of working.
Oh, but that's, that's maybe a little bit hyperbolic. But nevertheless, it becomes a form, a further form in, in space, in duration, and um, in space, in extension, and in time, in duration. You know, a form in this fallen, in this fallen world of forms, just like in the New Hebrides, one who has studied the ancient dances, participated in the ancient dances, become all the persona that you can become in the ancient dances. And then, because human life on this earth in this form is finite, that person dies. Then it is a different dimension that they are in. There is um, a continuation in different forms down through time with different trials, different adventures, different tests. What happens in the New Hebrides according to the findings and the interpretations and the poetic projections, the imaginative conceptions of R.G. Levy is once the person's died, they go to the threshold of a cave. There it is, the threshold of a cave. They are between the worlds. Oh, but the elements that they've studied and appreciated and sometimes seen all their lives in their ceremonial expressive lives is still before them. So it is said that you come to the threshold of the cave and the ground is sandy and there is a pattern upon the ground. It's a labyrinth. An elaborate labyrinth is a pattern drawn upon the ground. Who traced it? La Hevhev traced it. But who reaches out and scrubs out half of it? The guardian ghost. Yes, between the worlds you come to the threshold of the cave, and there is the labyrinth of the pattern traced upon the ground by the goddess La Hevhev, and then suddenly the foot of the fierce, the fearsome guardian ghost reaches out and erases half of it. And then what must you do? You must walk toward that labyrinth, step toward that labyrinth, and then trace out the erased element or the erased shape in the labyrinth. You trace it out out of your own memory of the dances and the footsteps and the personas that you inhabited in your life in the other world, which you are now no longer in. But out of your memory of that world, you trace that pattern and complete that design. And then the guardian ghost beckons you into the cave where you meet with Lehevhev and maybe you're reunited with all your friends and all your relatives. If, on the other hand, you forget the pattern or make a mistake, well then, the guardian ghost eats that day, if you know what I mean. So, inside the cave, before Lehevhev, who knows in what form she is, but there arises the fumes of the sacrifice, the sacrificed wild boar, sacrificed in the name of the goddess. And before Lehevhev, some kind of transaction occurs, or no, or perhaps some kind of like testimony or offering occurs, um, or maybe it's simply the testimony of the completion of the pattern that you made out of your dedicated memory and your skillful tracings. Maybe that is what persuades Lahevhev to take the boar as an offering rather than you, and then you can go and be with your friends in the afterlife or however they conceive of it. It can be like that. But Rachel Gertrude Levy has to say one more thing about that, because after conjuring this world of meaning, you know, in these very, very bare terms in our mind, uh, there's another, like, one more element, one more further penetration into the cave, so to speak, that she offers to us. And that is for some, for some of the initiates into the higher mysteries of these dances, the story doesn't end there necessarily, even after you've been granted a passage by Lahevhev. No, you, you are granted passage, but you end up, or you begin, on the shore of a vast and unknown sea. But 
not without help. You have in your hand a cane. It's just there. The cane is in your hands. You have gnawed upon the bark of a milk-giving tree. You have gnawed upon the bark of a milk-giving tree. You have a special cane or walking stick in your hand. And you build a beacon on the shore. And you build a beacon on the shore, and from across the dark waters comes um, the guide. And in the ferry boat of the guide, across the dark waters you go. Perhaps, you know, the night sea journey. And you come to the source of fire itself, a volcano, a mountain of fire, or a mountain with a fire within it. And, ooh, it must be strange up on the slopes of that volcano. It must be a peculiar kind of heaven. For there, amidst the flames, the skeletons dance. And this is the heaven where, amidst the flames, the skeletons dance. And um, I do not know if the initiates into the mysteries join the skeletons in their dance, who, by the way, um, at certain cycles, they take their skulls off and lay them on the ground, and then the pile of bones lays down on the ground, and then they sleep and rest for a while. And then when the time to dance comes again, the bones come together and the skeletons dance on. Oh, what a heaven it must be, you know. This is the imaginative projection the um, mythical conception from the intuitive pages of R.G. Levy <laughs> offered to you now um, in this form. And here comes the part where I have to say, even though this is digital, essentially the expressive meaning is still the word. So consider yourself reading <laughs> right now as I would say, in a certain sense of the word. And all that means is reading in this sense. Reading in a spoken setting simply means being present to the meanings as they begin to become composed in the mind. Because I, I, how I see it is um, there's a, com a, com a composure uh, hoped for uh, from my side, but then there's also a composition that is um, composed you know, is a mutual thing between us and the culture and the cosmos all the time. There has to, it has to be that way because I am drawing on it now to be doing what I'm doing, you see. So it's not like this is uh, anything but proof of that. But it takes its form in the way that it takes its form, right? And so, you know, it's, it's, either, it's either that or, you know, sounds in the air. But it's that too, and that's also good. All right. Now here's where I want to say, though, uh, what does what is involved in this? It's a transmission of the designs of form through all these different imagistic manifestations. And so um, the book gives us leave to speak of artistic creation and religious expression as being virtually one and the same. And we go from there, though. This is what I yearn for as an inner assurance. And this is what I find when I interpret the book to myself in this way, this and other books. Um, to me, it must be that the poetic imagination and the mind of compassion, they are virtually one and the same in this form of the movement of inspiration, in this imaginative conception that I'm trying to sketch out or limb out in this sense of like how a poem can take its meaning, or how a story can be told, or how the history of images and the places from which they are gathered can become and blend not only with the history of the world, but also with the history of the thoughts between us. For we, in our own imaginative, imaginative conceptions expressed and received, are replicating um, a joining together of the uh, inner structure of the, um, the healing forms that are there in the passages of time, which are simply the materials of the creative element in cultures and in, in human imaginative creations, be they communal or individual. 
ways to understand that and to track it and to see it and to discern it and to, yes, even make it up a little <laughs> as it goes along because that too is how we contribute to it. And so this is how that is. But now I want to say a little bit more. It relates to the pattern of a life and it relates to us um, individually in a sense, all in these different ways. A word here that I want to try to reach into in order in acknowledgement in acknowledgement of a friend, in acknowledgement and awe, honoring of a friend um, in community with um, certain um, pre-shadings, the very things that continue to come to fruition now, like a tree, like a tree does, um, this friend who was an artist in wood um, though at the time of some of these conversations, when we were roommates, um, we would find ourselves consistently, um, spontaneous metaphors would arise that we would kind of like pass back and forth in our conversations to each other. And it's kind of funny, speaking of whirls and wood, trees of the knowledge of good and evil and trees of life and the labyrinths and the, and the, and the branches, you know, and the whispering of the leaves um, and in the making of the things, the utilitarian things that we make from the tree, we would sometimes speak in um, terms of, 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 of wood and the changes of wood, the ways it can warp, the ways that it seasons. And um, I believe that... Um, uh, he really liked my explanation to him of how the the Japanese word for song is also the same as the word for a whirl in wood or a whirl in wood grain um, from where the, the branch of the tree grows. In other words, the grain curves and flows and does some turns around itself and then continues on its way, but that track is there as a sign for you to read with your intuitive reading eye as a sign in nature for you to understand the nature of songs. And I have to say also, though, that that original metaphor comes from Gary Snyder, I, I, probably in Earth Household. I, um, I cannot, um, it would be, it, I want that known so that because I'm going to have to go and, and think about what I've drawn from that sentence or that paragraph back when I read it so long ago and shared it with this friend back at that time. And oh, he really liked it. But what, what is clearer to me now as time goes on, the whole time in his mind, he was thinking of something in wood that he was actually going to create. So for, for, for me, what was poetic metaphor and a way to kind of join in together connected ideas so that maybe I could remember them or kind of like come to a deeper understanding of them, for him was Lord knows how many uh, stratagems and possibilities and ideas. And so eventually, you know, he becomes an artist in wood years, years later. But, um, and so I, I'm struck by the ways that um, he could bring to fruition um, things that in me uh, re remained in words. <laughs> so, so it's taken me this long, though, of course, to be able to honor my own medium and to, and to relate that to you, because that's how we will come to know him. That's how we will come to know this friend. Because this friend, too, with oh so many things that he did, not just in the carving of the wood or the, the um, intu intuitive comradeship of conversation and the... Um, just the freshness of the receptivity in the ways to respond to these ideas. Each of these little things, and you could sit here and stand here and think of one after the other, and it would probably never end. Each of them ways this individual expresses a vision of life. So this is something that we can learn to become more appreciative of as we continue, you know, being, uh, you know, beings in our moral imagination. So for that, that leads me to this poem I want to read, and then I'll probably have to check the time for just a moment. But this poem I wrote is called A Winter Stew of Beets, Beef Brisket, and Root Vegetables. A Winter Stew of 
beets, beef brisket, and root vegetables, the fantasy of our sensation of hot and cold as we slide in and out of our planetary school days, is there for one and all, smooth and hidden, roughed up and obvious like some medallion for the best crocus at the state fair or honorable mention in a hamburger eating contest? The didacticism comes from the movement of the image in the dimensions of the soul's moral imagination and from its own circle, from its own circling side, inside or out, spiraling or squiggled. It is simply a question of quickened interest. You can blow out the candle and become characters in each other's ghost story, no fuss. Or you can illuminate via inner glow and disappear into that, playfully, perfectly hidden. Either move will illustrate something to someone. So you see, that's my own words to try to come across to you with this idea that there is the moral imagination. I want to say, yes, I said I was going to check my watch. That intention I bring to, to pass. Okay, good. You know, the time is there. Um, that dimension, you know, um, is there, you know, in order to help us to bring, to bring something to pass. Um, but there is, uh, yes, the moral imagination. So, so about R.G. Levy, um, this is, I think, I just want to see if, if there's some creative or playful way that I can impart this to you. Because to me, um, in a notion of genre, you know, it's easy for me, and maybe I will from now on, think of this book as a prose poem. I might just do that, because that's how I'm treating it right now, and it certainly is. And of course, there's a whole, you know, extravagant kind of ways that one could go about in a Rococo way to explain that, but I don't necessarily um, want to go there with that. Instead, um, I want to look at it like it's a, um, it's a genre. It's a, it's a new kind of genre kind of thing. Um, it is kind of like, I don't, I don't know, it, it's like a transmutational a transmutational kind of, kind of um, tracing, of expostulation of, 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 of symbols or images. I don't know. Originally, it was something else as it was coming out of the gates of my mouth. But you know how these things go. They go. <laughs> Sometimes they come back. But, but who really knows about that? No, instead, um, it's her vision, and this is what I want to say, and it did come back. Because that's a part of nature. It's a part of the cycle, the pattern of existence, the way these ideas are. They are recollected. Yes, it comes from the pool of memory. And it is a real place, dimensionless or not, but the pool of memory for Rachel Gertrude Levy is a Platonist. She is a Platonist. And how fine to feel that fellowship. A creative Platonist. Why in this case? So simple. And I can hardly explain it. So simple because it's uh, a basic understanding of the way the image moves. I don't know. I guess I started off by trying to mention the moral imagination and the way the moral imagination is moved. I want to go from there to this notion of one's response to what moves one as an expression of the original moral imagination. And so, um, for Plato, it is the sun. But the sun is only visible. The sun is only a visible manifestation of an, of an interior reality, which is, which is the good. For like the sun, the good provides us with light by which we can see. Like the sun, the good provides the nourishing, germinating energy 
of the seed in the ground, which is such a, a unifying metaphor for any creative idea to speak of it as a seed in the ground. And like a seed in the ground, um, goodness, like the sun, nourishes it and brings it forth. And um, so it is the sun that is with our earthly eye. We um, can conceive for our imaginative eye, or perhaps our imaginative eye is what conceives the sun as its, as its external manifestation. It could be something like that. But to just to bring in the cave for just a little bit, and um, her writings in the tradition of Platonism, Plato, as a, as a genre. Because, two, uh, it also, Plato's dialogues are, are constructed so as, as works of art. It is almost as if, um, I wonder, you know, and, and I wonder if it's really saying all that much, but to think that maybe 7,000 years from now, Plato's dialogues will be considered prose poems, and the figure of Socrates will be a fountain of all these different kinds of genres, these genres of expression. I think it could be something like that. And in, from, as I am assured and inspired by the mind of Rachel Gertrude Levy, I am sure that, you know, it is a possibility that is, is pretty simple to conceive of. But anyway... So we have to have that in our minds in order to understand one more visit to the cave. We have to go into the cave one more time in order to witness uh, the um, um, conception of the way it is with us in our consciousness. So from Plato, it's, it's, it's the cave. And inside the cave, it's a sloping, gravelly, harsh kind of slope. And then it goes down, flattens out a little bit. And then there's a wall. It is the cave wall. And there are people there. Ah, but they are constrained. Their faces and their necks and their heads are constrained so that they can only see the wall before them. And it's always been this way with them. And behind the people, there is a fire. And it crackles and glows like fires do. And over near to it, there is a road. But it's not the road so much that's our concern here. It's that wall by the road, because behind that wall there are crouch other people, and they're the puppeteers, and they have artifacts, and devices, and shapes, and outlines, and silhouettes, and they project uh, by the fire's light upon the cave wall on the opposite, all these changing images and sights, which the people who are constrained in viewing only that and have viewed only that since the very beginning of their own consciousness, that's all they see. And not only are there the images of the shadows on the wall, but I believe there are sound effects. <laughs> only they think it's coming from just this one thing that they see before them. And they are the denizens inside of the cave. Imagine then for them, as Plato offers it to us in this, in this transforming kind of poetic metaphor, um, that we can kind of interpret and play with, you know? An usher, the usher comes in and b begins to go to work. <laughs> or, you know, a benevolent agent comes in, begins to go to work, undoes the chains and the fastenings and the constraints and takes one, an individual, one individual, and gently helps that individual up who probably is ever so stiff because he's never moved in any other way before and has brought up a harsh, steep slope. I mean, imagine being always constrained in one position, and now you're going up a harsh slope. It must be strange to move, and then is dragged toward this awful, dazzling thing. It is the fire. It is the fire. It dazzles the eyes. Imagine if your eyes are only used to darkness, and suddenly there's this bright, dazzling fire. It's got to be unpleasant, especially if you don't know what it is. And then there's a voice saying to you, Behold the source of the figments that you have seen. And then, oh, so not only is the dazzling brightness of it all affecting you, but it's the strangeness of the instructions that are being told to you as an interpretation of what you're seeing. Would you or would you not believe that? 
It would be almost too much. But then imagine yourself dragged up the upslope of that hill again and then dragged out into the far more dazzling light of day. Oh, can you imagine how shocking that would be? Especially if you come anywhere near actually seeing the actual sun, which is the visible manifestation of goodness, which is the source of the energy of this entire conception of consciousness. Imagine how unpleasant it would be. Oh, but you would get used to it in a good way, in an educative way. Didactically, you would become used to seeing in this new way and what you saw in this new way. But imagine how strange it would be, how wondrous it would be. You would have to learn gradually, of course. You would probably have to read the reflections in rain puddles, looking down in order to get used to what you see when you look up. You have to start with baby food and learn to chew and digest before you advance on to, you know, steaks and mushrooms and vegetables and garlic and pickles, right? And so it would be like that. And you would gradually learn to accustom your eyes when to look and when not to look and what, what it means in the way that you perceive and all of this. This is the journey toward truth as, as Plato gives it to us in this poetic image of the metaphor of the cave. But let's look at its social realist side also. Imagine the ones still down there. What would it be like to go back in there? Wouldn't the darkness so familiar before be suddenly strange to you? And imagine what could you communicate to them? Oh, I have been to another world. It is more real than this one. I can tell you everything. Would they even understand? It would be strange to them. There is a dazzling light. Well, you know, you would, you would just, you would have to show them yourself. They would have to go on that journey themselves in order to understand that. And this is the path that is traced. And uh, as a metaphorical image, um, this path of individuation, this path of, of learning and growth in consciousness and spirit and the soul that um, Rachel Gertrude Levy offers us through her book, this, this way of understanding that we can kind of draw out and kind of tease out. So that's a little bit of a, that journey into that. I also wanted to mention this friend of mine. I'm going to read one more poem to this friend of mine in honor of it. Uh, everything that I'm saying now can be traced back to him in some sense. And it was there in both of us long before. We were roommates at a time when we were both going through the same kind of initiatory doorway. And um, it was the best of times and the worst of times, which is how, you know, friendships are forged. And I want to add, oh, if I can do it quickly, in a platonic myth, um, it was Hermes, uh, in cooperation, under the guidance, really, of Zeus, who brought to human beings, according to Plato, the gifts of justice in the consciousness and friendship in the consciousness. Yes, it was Epimetheus who gave to human beings so precious little. It was Epimetheus who gave to, you know, the animals their claws and their thick skins and their, you know, all their strengths and endurances. And by the time he handed out all these animal qualities, there was very little left for the humans. And so his brother Prometheus had to come and, and, and um, compensate for that by um, stealing from Hephaestus and Athena um, techne the technical skills in a way that you interact with the atmosphere and the substances in such a way to benefit your physical existence. Prometheus is the one who enabled human beings to conceive out of nothing a way to live and survive in the world. And yet, it wasn't enough. How could it be? Because when they gathered together, there was conflict. They fought and they were brutal and they were awful because they behaved as animals did. So it was Hermes, the messenger, who brought to people the gifts of of the God, of friendship and justice, and all these notions that become um, our common inheritance from our culture. 
but they had to adjust it because it's a, it's a lot it's a learning process. It was such that Hermes said to Zeus, and I quote, uh, "Zeus, um, pop." Um, no, I'm sure that they would be. Well, Hermes can get away with a lot of informality, so who knows? But Hermes, you know, I got a, I gave these people uh, friendship and and justice, and but now he, let, let's think about this now, uh, Zeus, because you know I'm also the god of education, of intuitive education, and and what I've got to tell you is um, this justice and this friendship is it like carpentry or the skill in woodworking? I don't think so, right? And Zeus said, No, no, it is not like that. Is it like doctoring? or um, fortune-telling, or lion-taming. Is it anything like that? No, no, it's not like that. So then, oh, uh, Father Zeus, it's not that I would give this gift of friendship and justice in certain amounts more to uh, some than others, so that those who have that gift in a larger amount can be um, a support to those who have that gift in the less amount. Is it like that? No, no, said Zeus. It's got to be something that is common to all. Because in the life of the city and in the life of the people gathering together, oh, obviously Zeus has come a long way from the arbitrary thunderbolts in this particular myth, right? But it's Zeus who says, I think this is a gift that must be given to all in equal measure. Now, it's not going to be available to some as it is to others. And the ways that they're going to understand it are going to be as different as there are people. But nevertheless, these things, O Hermes, my son, you give them all equally to all the people because it is what they need and part of what they are that makes them human beings. And so Hermes did that. So that's how he got the gift of friendship via Hermes. And so this is a hermetic explanation of friendship on behalf of, in honor of, a friend of mine who's an artist to the soul. And so this is this poem. I will read it. I, I wrote it on March 15th on the Ides of March. I've got to turn the pages in this journal to get to that date, and then uh, I will tell you it's about my Aristotelian friend. Um, and it goes like this. Its title is actually A Humble Man of Mystery. Twists and turns in conversational flow transparent to each other we could be, so that images of concept touched upon and lit up our mutual unconscious value systems. We were involved in formulating communally into an aesthetic we could both work toward as a shared ideal. So that today there are these unknown birds above me, in the blue sky, headed north. It is the Ides of March, for it was when I wrote this. It is the Ides of March, and I do not know these birds, white with their black wings, all seven of them. And now, as they are so far off, the slanting sunlight makes their whiteness flash. They bring me news of his Aristotelian mystery. So this is what I have to say, this friend, tracing out a labyrinth. And I assure you, it will be creatively done. <laughs> if it hasn't already. And of course, these things are contemporaneous. <laughs> but so how the Plato thing works into all this is there are the energies, as I'm still learning to understand it, my own personality is like this. I'm just trying to understand how the different forms are communicating themselves to my consciousness, even as my own inner workings go on in the same way. So outside in were some of these metaphors that we spoke of in the way that I was conceiving of them. It's like I wanted through the cracks between the um, phrases that were, you know, tumbling out of, you know, the mind I wanted to see farther into like this inner part of it so as to be able to see inside, from inside the word looking out, from inside the thought looking out, because that is how you make poetry. That's one way, one quest, one little, you know, barricade of heaven to try to leap over, or of hell, if you wish. Um, whereas for him, so I call it an Aristotelian mystery. And so here's a, here's a quote from Aristotle or a paraphrase. Aristotle said, the lover of myths 
composed of wonders, is simultaneously a lover of wisdom, for myths are composed of wonders, and wonders are the beginnings, then and now, of philosophy. So the lover of myths, composed of wonders, is also a lover of wisdom. For myths are composed of wonders, and wonders are the beginning of philosophy. So it's like, a, this is part of the labyrinth. Oh, maybe this is good to learn <laughs> as a succession of ideas. Um, but Aristotle said this, and so the whole time I'm talking to this friend of mine about the seasoning and the wood and everything, years later, he holds in his hand a bowl, a bowl composed of the burl of a branch of wood that he has turned and learned. And um, so I see before my eyes, my physical eye, the, the manifested thing in physical reality of this living thing that had its birth as what was before just a dim emotion in my mind, a mythical conception. But, you know, what is the world of time and space and of substance but the fruition of a particular mythic vision which, you know, comes to us, is offered to us by such gifted individuals as my friend and um, Rachel Gertrude Levy. So that's what this talk is about, the Gate of Horn. So much more to say, but for now it's time to thank you for your heroic listening. And may we all um, continue on our um, unique way, joyfully nourished by the imaginative nourishment that is there for us that we can attune ourselves to as we go along our studious ways. Anyway, that's the message. And uh, thank you for your heroic listening. So long for now.